Okay, so today let us continue our discussion of uh, the uh, fluid dynamics equation. So, we have uh, painstakingly derived two equations. One is uh, called the Euler equation which tells us uh, how the velocity of the fluid changes with time. The other is the uh, more familiar continuity equation which tells you that uh, in any region the total mass of the fluid uh, is uh, either constant or if it changes it is because of uh, fluid coming from outside the of, the of that region. So, basically these are the two equations. So, this is the Euler equation and uh, this is the Euler equation, this is the continuity equation. So, uh, so the question is uh, we of course, uh, in general you can see first of all that these equations are nonlinear. They are nonlinear because uh, the unknowns are basically rho and v and uh, the equation for the unknowns uh, appear uh, you know it, it is not linear. In other words, uh, first of all there is uh, even if you assume this rho in the denominator is approximately constant there is still this this term uh, the convective derivative which is basically nonlinear and that is one of the major source of nonlinearity. The other source of nonlinearity could be this, but then typically even you can assume that uh, in many examples we assume rho is uh, you know like some constant plus some fluctuations. So, even then uh, then if you choose to ignore that then of course, you can linearize these equation in very many different ways, but you have to do it in a way that is uh, mathematically acceptable and that is not always easy. But bottom line is that uh, if you decide to just uh, look at the formalism, these are the equations that you have to deal with and there, are, there have been no uh, approximations made except uh, the only um, physical assumption that we have made is that there is no internal friction that means there is no viscosity. So, these, e these are equations of fluid dynamics that describe fluids with no viscosity that means ideal fluids. Okay, uh, so, even within these ideal fluids you can have situations that make our life simpler and uh, those are listed here. So, the situations that are likely to simplify these equations even further are the following. So, there is this concept called the incompressible fluid. So, the incompressible fluid means that the density of the fluid is constant. So, in fact, uh, you can easily see that uh, it is sufficient for us to demand that the density of the fluid does not change from point to point. Uh, that immediately guarantees that it cannot change with time also because if you look at the total number of particles the integral of the density with, with respect to volume. So, if the density is constant it goes outside the integral and you get total volume times the density. So, now that total volume uh, is anyway fixed it is given the density uh, if it is dependent on time then it will uh, mean that uh, basically uh, uh, the uh, so if density depends on time so this is basically the total number of particles which cannot change with time so density also cannot change with time isn't it so uh, so that means that it's sufficient for us to demand that the density of the particles should be independent of position that automatically guarantees that it should also be independent of time because total number of particles are anyway independent of time. Okay, so, the other thing is uh, irrotational. So, uh, irrotational like I told you that uh, velocity uh, can always be written as the gradient of a scalar at all points where the density of the fluid does not become 0. Okay and uh, that is another simplification that we can readily exploit. The other thing uh, the third uh, example uh, is uh, called steady state. So, steady state is an assumption that uh, your velocities and densities are independent of time. So, that means if whatever disturbances are there have kind of died down and uh, so the velocity and density have uh, reached some steady state. So, in other words it it changes from point to point in space, but it does not change with time. Okay. So, these are the three uh, different types of uh, simplifying assumptions uh, 
that we can exploit and some of them are uh, not assumptions like rotational is, is just an observation that you can always write velocities. See when you, you can always write velocity as the gradient of a scalar whenever the density is not 0 at that point. So, let us uh, try to simplify these two equations that is Euler equation and equation of continuity uh, using these uh, further simplifying assumptions namely let us start with for example incompressible. So, uh, if you start with incompressible that means it is a fluid whose density is constant both in space and time in which case uh, you see the equation of continuity will immediately tell you that that means the divergence of velocity should be 0 because rho is constant. But then uh, let us also uh, keep in mind that rho is constant and therefore not 0 because if it is 0 and constant then you do not have any particles left. So, it has to be necessarily non-zero. So, because it is non-zero velocity can always be written as the gradient of a scalar and further velocity is also uh, divergence free that means it is divergence of velocity is 0. So, that means that del squared of that scalar uh, potential of the velocity that means velocity is the gradient of scalar. So, that scalar quantity has this property that del squared of that quantity is 0. So, now uh, so in other words uh, solving for the properties of a fluid whose density is uh, totally uniform uh, just involves solving a Laplace equation. So, now let us consider uh, a specific geometry because other you have to specify of course, Laplace equation is second order partial differential equation. So, that means you have to specify various boundary conditions before you solve it. And so, boundary condition means you should explain what the geometry you are looking at. So, specifically let us focus on two spatial dimensions this del squared pi could be it is always valid in all dimensions. So, now I am going to focus uh, specialized to a case where the problem is in two dimensions. So, in two spatial dimensions uh, yeah, there is uh, an obstacle uh, in the shape of a wedge uh, which has an angle alpha. Okay. So, now the boundary condition is that the velocity normal to the obstacle vanishes at the surfaces. Okay. So, uh, so, the idea is that you see the, uh, the fluid flows along the surface when it near the surface it flows along it is kind of. Uh, so, in other words uh, the net uh, velocity of the fluid uh, perpendicular to the surface is 0. Okay. So, that is the boundary condition that we are looking at. So, uh, clearly uh, in this case uh, the polar coordinates is natural because uh, the geometry is that of uh, you know some kind of an angle. So, that means some uh, there is some angular region in two dimensions. So, uh, plane polar coordinates are natural in this case. So, the Laplacian in plane polar coordinates is given by this. So, now as usual uh, you might have encountered this method many many times uh, in your electromagnetic theory and PDE courses. So, how do you solve uh, uh, PDE? Typically you solve by uh, separation of variables. So, if you have two independent variables r and theta you assume that your uh, dependent variable namely pi can be written as the product of uh, you know I mean some function of r separately and some function of theta separately. Of course, this is not a I mean this is you might think that this is uh, unacceptably simple assumption. Uh, so, you might think that uh, it will miss out a whole bunch of other solutions uh, which may not be expressible in this form and of course, that is true, but the implication is that we do not stop here. In other words, Suppose you get uh, a whole bunch of uh, you you won't get one solution like this. You will get a whole bunch of them. So you'll get this, you'll get this, you'll get a whole lot of these solutions. So the claim is that the most general solution can be written as the linear combination of all these, because after all, this particular equation is linear in pi. So that means if pi is a solution. Pi one is a solution. Pi two is a solution. Uh, C1 pi, pi C2 pi 2 is also. So, in other words this is a linear equation the Laplace equation is linear. So, so the implication is that even though um, it seems that writing it in, in this separated form. So, that means we have assumed separation of variables we have separated them into r and theta seems like unreasonably excessively simplistic. Uh, 
but uh, keep in mind that that is just an intermediate step in the final calculation namely that we provisionally assume that this is the case and then we generate a whole bunch of these types of solution and then uh, there is a mathematics theorem which will guarantee that the most general solution to the Laplace equation is in fact given by the linear combination of all these different solutions that you generate by assuming or imposing separability. Okay, so keeping once you have that at the back of your mind, so you will probably feel a little more assured in going ahead. So let us go ahead and substitute the ansatz, namely this separability ansatz and so when you separate them you get this relation and clearly what uh, what this means is that you know this is only a function of r, this is only a function of theta, so both had better be constants and those constants had better add up to 0. So I am going to call this, this, uh, this has to be a constant, I am going to call that constant an n minus n squared minus uh, n squared because I want the solutions to be trigonometric because I want you know, you know why it has to be trigonometric because the theta that you are talking about this, the lower case theta is the angle, so there has to be periodicity, so it had better be trigonometric and this has to therefore necessarily be plus n squared, the, uh, the other one because they have to add up to 0. Okay, so, uh, so then we go ahead and uh, so this is a basically a homogeneous equation whose solution is uh, given by uh, some homogeneous uh, ansatz and then uh, so you have two linearly independent solution r, r raised to n and r raised to minus n. So the, the general solution is linear combination of these two. Now the uh, keep in mind that I have said that the velocity uh, vanishes on the boundary of, of the obstacle. Uh, so let us see uh, bottom line is that you expect the uh, not not the velocity is the normal component of the velocity. So you see uh, the uh, the normal component of the velocity is basically the uh, it's it's uh, so if you write it in terms of r and theta, so it's the velocity is nothing but uh, you have v r r cap plus v theta theta cap. So so this is your theta. So you see at any point on the boundary the normal component is basically in the angular direction. Okay. So here for example, here you are talking about the normal component is in the angular direction. Okay. So this is radial, this is angular. So I mean here the radial is this, this is the angular. So here the radial is this, this is the angular. So the, uh, the claim is that the angular component of the velocity should be 0 because that is normal to the surface. So it is the normal angular component is normal to this surface at this point of the boundary and this point of the boundary also this angular component is normal to the So in other words V theta has to be 0 and what is V theta? V theta is basically uh, 1 by R uh, d by d theta of uh, pi because v theta is the angular part of grad. So the angular part of grad is 1 by r d by d theta. So with a minus m like that. Okay. So this has to be 0 on the boundary. So that is why I have said that the basically that this has to be 0 on the boundary. So there are two boundaries. One is at theta equal to 0. That is the this one. So this is theta equal to 0 and this is theta equal to alpha. So there are two boundaries. So that means d capital theta as a function of uh, lowercase theta should be 0 at lowercase theta equal 0 and uh, similarly the derivative with respect to lowercase theta should be 0 also when uh, the lowercase is equal to the second boundary which is at alpha. So these two imply necessarily that uh, the um, the angular dependence has to be like that because this will ensure that uh, this is uh, you see if you take the derivative d pi by d theta it becomes sin. So uh, this becomes sin of pi, uh, pi alpha into theta. So which is 0 when uh, theta is 0 and it is also 0 when theta is alpha. Uh, 
and the rest has to be basically equal to n and minus n and uh, that n is necessarily this, this is what n is. So, that is pi by alpha. So, this is your answer. Okay. And then uh, we also demand that uh, the velocity should uh, vanish at infinity because we do not expect the velocity to keep growing as you go further and further away uh, from the vertex. So, therefore, uh, we expect this to become 0 because alpha is positive and we expect that to be 0. So, that is the answer. Okay. So, and then uh, uh, well that is the answer for this uh, pi which is uh, potential of the velocity, velocity potential. So, you take the gradient, uh, you get the velocity and your, so this is your final answer. So, let us see what all equations we have exploited to, uh, we have spent a lot of time, it looks like we have fully solved the problem, but actually no. And the reason why it is no is because we still do not know what this b is um, and also we have only exploited one of those equations. So, remember there were two equations, one is the Euler equation, the other is continuity equation. So, all we have done is exploit this, this equation, divergence b equals 0 and the fact that B is rotational, that is all we have exploited. So, we have completely ignored the uh, important equation which tells you how velocity is supposed to change with time, which of course it does not change with time because we have assumed steady state. Okay. Uh, well, let us see. Yeah. So, we have assumed steady state. So, if steady state, uh, so this is 0. Okay, so, now let us go ahead and exploit Euler equation, see where it takes us. So, uh, velocity is uh, independent of time, so that is left hand side is 0, left hand side of 4.136. So, therefore, uh, this is saying that basically, so we will assume that uh, there are no body forces like we will ignore the weight of the fluid and all that, uh, that does not make sense in this 2D geometry. But however, there is pressure and there has to be because you see these two are not, if, if you randomly choose everything 0, then these two will become self-contradictory. So, we have to assume that there is some kind of a pressure gradient and that should be uh, something that your theory predicts. So, in other words, it tells you what. So, therefore, there ought to be a pressure gradient that is set up in the fluid in order for the fluid to behave in this particular way. So, that is the in correct interpretation of this problem. So, the correct interpretation is that imagine there is a wedge with angle alpha and there is a fluid flowing uh, you know into and out of this wedge in such a way that the velocity of the fluid is uh, 0 perpendicular to the surfaces at those surfaces and 0 at infinity and it is uh, unif it has uniform density and it is steady state. So, the so given all these assumptions, the question is what sort of pressure gradients have to be set up in the fluid in order for the fluid to be to behave in this particular manner. So, the answer is exactly obtained by solving this equation given the fact that we have already reached this far. So, we have found velocity through continuity equation and then you simply substitute that here and uh, you get this result for your pressure. Okay. So, so this basically tells you what the pressure is. So, uh, it of course tells you in terms of some constant b which is still undetermined and that has to be further supplied by somebody. So, that cannot be determined. Somebody has to say this is the velocity at this point and in terms of that you can express B in terms of that. So, bottom line is that the, uh, the pressure has to have a position dependence and uh, it has to be in this way. Okay? So, that is the, that's the story of this um, fluid flowing through a wedge. Okay? So, that was just an example which uh, illustrates uh, how you can determine uh, the specific manner in which a fluid flows, you know, given the Euler equation and the continuity equation. So, and using further simplifying assumptions. So, now let us uh, come back to some generalities. So, uh, I am going to discuss a very important uh, result which is familiar to school students. 
course, uh, at the school level, you kind of uh, simply told that that is what it is and you are forced to memorize that formula and pretty much every formula that you encounter at the school level, you are simply told that that is how it is and you are supposed to memorize it. But uh, this course is uh, one where you pull back the screen and you uh, see the wizard behind. In other words, uh, I am going to tell you how those formulas came about that you are so familiar with that you have memorized from your school days and uh, I am going to be able to tell you how to derive them now. So, uh, one such equation that you would have memorized uh, long ago would be Bernoulli's equation for an incompressible fluid. So, the Bernoulli principle as, as it is sometimes called. So, uh, just like uh, you know in uh, classical mechanics, uh, you see if you have Newton's laws of motion and you have a, uh, forces which are derivable from a potential, the, uh, there is a quantity namely the total energy of the system is conserved. So, the kinetic plus potential. So, the kinetic energy uh, basically energy is a scalar quantity whereas, the velocity and position are vector quantities. So, similarly even here in fluids, uh, you see our velocity or the vector quantity and you had this rate of change of velocity equals something which is the Euler equation. Now, I want to derive a scalar quantity corresponding to uh, these Euler equation continuity equations that is uh, finally conserved. So, that means I want a scalar conserved quantity analogous to what I would do with energy in case of point particle classical mechanics. So, I am going to focus or uh, restrict my attention to uh, incompressible fluids in which case divergence of V is 0. So, you see uh, in that case my uh, continuity equations can be, uh, so I, uh, sorry my uh, Euler equation was this. Now, uh, I know for a fact that uh, in regions where the density is non-zero and in fact that is pretty much everywhere because density is a constant. So, I am going to assume that uh, density is constant. Okay, So, I am going to have assumed that density is constant in time and space. So, so in that case you have uh, density is non-zero. So, velocity is uh, expressible or uh, derivable from the gradient of a scalar. So, uh, you just go ahead and substitute that here and uh, all of a sudden you will be able to uh, rewrite this equation. So, this is basically the Euler equation rewritten in terms of this scalar potential uh, whose gradient is the velocity. Okay, um, so, this can be rewritten in this way. And uh, so, it basically tells you the gradient of something involving the scalar potential is 0. So, therefore, that something has to be independent of position. Okay. So, now we will further assume that we are talking about steady state. So, in, in the case of steady state, uh, there are no explicit time dependences. So, if that is the case, then you can immediately convince yourself that so if g is uh, you know g is the acceleration due to gravity which I have included just for good measure. So, uh, that is uh, in the negative z direction uh, suppose in which case uh, you can clearly see that this equation and this is nothing but velocity. So, this basically uh, becomes uh, so when you have explicit time independence. So, then this is derivative is 0 and this is independent of time is an absolute constant because anyway uh, it was independent of position, it worst case it depended on time, but even that is not there because it is steady state. So, now, uh, so what this means therefore is that this equation tells you that this, this thing put together is constant and what this thing is is basically energy, well energy divided by density. So, energy per unit volume divided by density. All right, so this is basically tells you that uh, whatever that is is constant, and that's called Bernoulli's principle. So what it effectively tells you that uh, uh, if you ignore this this term, if you ignore the acceleration due to gravity, what this says is basically, and uh, rho is constant. So if rho is constant, what it basically says is that in regions where the fluid flow is fast, 
this the velocity of the fluid is speed of the fluid is very high the pressure is low and uh, vice versa in fact uh, i am reminded of this uh, principle every day in my in my room where i have my cupboard where i have my clothes there and it's a wooden cupboard and uh, i don't lock it many times and whenever i switch on the fan the cupboard door swings open so the reason is uh, not because of some mysterious ghost uh, it's because of bernoulli principle so the uh, fan outside creates uh, air flow with a high velocity and uh, therefore the pressure outside is less than what is inside so inside the cupboard there is no uh, air flow is not uh, is air flow is static so the speed is zero so the pressure inside is high inside the cupboard but outside uh, the air flow has a high velocity so the pressure is low so the in pressure inside the cupboard is more than the pressure outside and if i don't lock the cupboard the door will swing open so that's what happens every time and uh, it that's the reason why you have to lock your cupboard because uh, you know otherwise you can lose your belongings or some insects can get in and so on anyway whatever it is so that is the uh, so you can see the bernoulli's principle in action in your daily life also okay uh so now i'm going to uh so this is another interesting uh, so now that i have told you what bernoulli's principle is i'm going to ask you to go back to the earlier example involving this wedge and i want you to convince yourself that uh, the the wedge equation which basically t- tells you what the pressure is and what the velocity is uh, so you see we have derived pressure and velocity both by solving uh, Euler equation and continuity equation and so on and so forth. So we we know both from this earlier wedge example, the pressure and the velocity. So if you know both, so the question is that Bernoulli principle also involves both. So namely this and this. So the question is that is the earlier derivation of this wedge problem, where we derived the formula for pressure in terms of r and theta and velocity in terms of r and theta is that consistent with bernoulli principle so let us see if it is or it isn't so uh, so you see a substitute uh, v squared see what is v squared because this this is v and this is a unit vector so, so that's the square of that is 1 so therefore v squared is uh, simply equal to so this so now you can see that uh, this is uh, so um, we want the uh, cons so this so what bernoulli's principle says is that half v squared plus p y rho is constant but then that constant has to be zero because uh, at r equal to infinity we expect uh, both the pressure and velocity to be uh, zero so if that's the case this is zero so therefore pressure is minus rho times this so that's exactly what we got here so uh, so in our words we didn't we could have derived this uh, 4.151 from bernoulli's principle but rather we did not we actually derived it by uh, substituting uh, the uh, solution of uh, this laplace equation which you obtain from continuity equation into euler's equation so by substituting euler's equation you got the pressure you could have done it more easily by simply invoking the bernoulli principle but uh, well that uh, we had not derived that yet so so now that we have derived bernoulli's principle you are free to do either so it's typically easier to invoke the bernoulli principle just like it is e- easier to invoke energy conservation when you want to solve for the motion of particles because that's already the first integral of the motion Whereas the you see uh, Newton's second law involves two derivatives with respect to time. Uh, energy conservation is half m v squared plus potential energy equals constant. But then uh, half m v squared v is first derivative in position, so the, you already integrated once with respect to time. So basically, uh, it's already a first integral. So it's always more convenient to start with energy conservation. So here too. <coughs> 
it's always easier to start with Bernoulli principle because that's precisely the analog of energy conservation in fluids. Okay, I'm, now I'm going to stop. This is a good place to stop because the next topic is going to involve viscosity. So, the Navier-Stokes equation is the next topic where I'm going to describe what I have ignored till now, namely the fact that uh, fluids don't have to necessarily be ideal. So, that means the uh, different layers of a fluid can exert friction on each other and that leads to some further uh, modifications of the equations that we have been writing down. So, I am going to stop now. I hope you will uh, join me for the next class which is all about uh, this uh, very famous Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.